be a member of SEDS and you're interested in the field, you're welcome to join us. And if you come across any questions during the webinar, feel free to drop them in the chat so we can present them to the speaker at the end of the session. So today's topic is gravity and life. And joining with us to speak about this is Professor Carl Hassenstein. He's a professor of biology at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. He has a PhD in plant physiology from the University of Saarland, and he has extensively studied gravitational biology. So it's a great honor to have you here as a speaker for today. I think biology is the least explored part when it comes to space education in our country, and I hope this webinar sparks interest in the minds of our audience about the field. So once again, welcome to said space talk, and Professor, I warmly invite you to carry on the lecture. Well, thank you very much. I hope you can hear and see. I'm yes, going to share my screen with you, if I may, because this was not possible since the host has disabled screen sharing. I cannot do it until you allow me to share my screen. But if that happens, I will show you a few um, pictures and discuss gravity and gravitational effects in general and a certain set of problems that we encounter when we leave our mothership and go into space. And I will then talk about um, some of my own research. So I was waiting for the host to allow me to share the screen, but that doesn't seem to be the case yet. Would you please change that? I, I don't know if uh, Timira or Shala is able to change the setting, uh, but I cannot proceed unless that is fixed. Yes, Tashmir, if you are person, can you enable this? Okay, very good. I can do it now. And I hope you can see my um, shared screen. Yes, sir. So uh, thanks for the introduction. And I will proceed with what I have to say, as I, as I said uh, before. Um, there will be a brief overview of the effects of gravity. Um, what happens when gravity is not acting, that is not to say that it is uh, absent, but it is compensated. And among these things, the most prevalent one is reduced buoyancy, fluid shifts, water flow, and gas exchange. I will pay some extra um, emphasis on space effects, including radiation. I've done some work on this, and then gravity compensation before I talk about my own research. So, what is gravity? Gravity is simply a force between masses. And in this case, we are not going to the um, nitty-gritty but if you look at this picture later, you will realize that the force is simply the product 
of the mass of the two entities that interact divided by the square of the distance between these masses times the universal gravitation constant. And I provide the measures and values for the individual numbers, um, which results in the force that we are all familiar with, which happens to be G, the gravitational force on our planet expressed as 9.8 meter per second square. So this is the force that life has evolved under and is essentially a constant. There are minor variations based on the altitude. When you go to a high mountain, it's a little less. If you go in lower areas, it's a little more. But uh, for the most part, this is a constant force, a constant acceleration. So. When we look at space exploration, we have to consider things that go beyond our comfort zone. And the example that I give here is simply supposed to illustrate what it takes to develop a mindset that enables us to free ourselves from the confinements of gravity, from the confinements of Earth, and begin to understand life and science on a larger scale. So the quote that I have written down here, we have taken to the moon the wealth of this nation, and it is fair to say the wealth of this Earth. The vision of its leaders, the intelligence of its scientists, the dedication of engineers, craftsmanship of workers, and the enthusiastic support of people. And in return, we have brought back rocks, which is typically not very valuable. But in this context, as uh, Michael Collins writes, it's a fair trade and they opened insights into bodies that we were not able to study previously. So it's important to realize that new research begins with tiny little steps, sometimes symbolized as rocks. And lastly, it's important to understand what is um, so beautifully stated by Tsiolkovsky, the earth is the cradle of mankind. We grew up here, we developed, we evolved, but we cannot live in a cradle forever, which is a justification and a stimulation to go beyond what we have here on earth. And that's the topic of the talk. So I will try to put things in the context of going to Mars. When we go to Mars, we do a few things. The most important one is we leave Earth behind. We have to develop new technology. We have to get used to conditions that are totally foreign to everyone. And the most important aspect of this is the fact that we have to travel for a long time, long in the relationship to human life, before we reach the target, and that is completely novel. This is comparable to what the early discoverers went through when they set foot on unknown continents. It was not known how people get along with each other. It is still not known what the psychological problems will be to be confined in a tin can, essentially, for an extended period of time. But the transit also includes exposure to radiation, something we don't have to worry about on Earth, but it comes very dominant and very critical for a long journey. When we do this, we have to start with what is going on right now. We have to inch ever so closer to the final target, which is Mars. 
but by doing the things that are happening right now, research on the International Space Station, the development of ever um, faster and more powerful rockets, we can shorten the travel time and to a large extent alleviate the problems that I just mentioned. And the ultimate step of a journey to Mars is to have something that is pretty independent of where we come from, independent of Earth. And if you have seen the movie The Martian or some other science fiction related story, it is an attempt to describe what it means to go to strange places. But this is all fantasy. We don't really have any idea yet as to what it means to conquer a condition and a planet and physical and chemical constraints that all play a significant role for sustaining our livelihood. So that is the topic of space exploration in the context of journey to Mars. So the space station and the different aspects that you see here are critical for the development of technology and the preparedness of uh, humans to go to Mars. So I go to a few examples as to what it means to travel. And we can calculate, for example, the orbital speed based on something that you are familiar with when you work <clears throat> in the life sciences lab. On the left column, I hope you can see this uh, area here, you will see a calculation that is based on a centrifuge. So when you consider the space station, the ISS, as part of a centrifugal system, you can calculate what the satellite, the ISS, speed is in terms of revolutions per second. When the altitude is 300 kilometers above Earth, at that condition, Z, that is the gravitational acceleration um, at that distance, is not 9.8 but 8.2 meters per second square. So you plug in the numbers and you will obtain this value. You have to fly at an incredibly high speed in order to compensate the force of gravity. In order to compensate this value that makes the space station want to fall back to Earth. The balancing between this extraordinary velocity and the resulting centrifugal force is the compensation of gravity. So when people say it's microgravity, this is, of course, not correct. It is the exact balance of the existing residual gravity of 8.2 meters per second square by the velocity of the orbiting station. So as you go farther away from Earth, this velocity does not have to be at that rate. So it is less force, less centrifugal force required to put things into a perfect balance. When you do the same calculation based on mass, as you see in this column, you will obtain essentially the same value, 27,000 120 kilometers per hour. But the advantage of this calculation is that it does not rely on um, the acceleration due to the force of gravity. We have still a complete compensation. So I put this in just to remind you that we don't really have to worry about um, microgravity or gravity mysteriously disappearing, we balance it. So in this sense, any satellite is a gravity compensator. 
it is no longer experiencing weight. Therefore, the condition is properly described as weightlessness. So, as I pointed out, living in space has challenges. The very important one of being confined into a small space is tasking. It means we have no escape mechanism. We cannot take a walk in the woods. We cannot go away from our companions. We are confined to a small space for an extremely long time. And this is unknown in its effect on the psyche of people. There is very little or no personal space or privacy. You may have heard that NG14 launched a few days ago. I had an experiment. I have an experiment in this capsule. And one of the things that was sent to the ISS was a new space toilet. This space toilet is not a fun place to use, but it is one of the examples of what it means to live in space. And privacy and things like that are not going to be um, at the forefront of the designer's concern. The other thing that goes with it is relatively poor hygiene. You cannot re really take a bath or a shower because water doesn't flow down or it doesn't really do anything other than clinging to the next possible object. I will show you examples of this. So because of this, you need to take care of your body and the hygiene is accomplished by wiping your body down with um, uh, something that many people experience now in the context of COVID-19. We have to use hand sanitizers all the time. The same is true as um, for, for space, for body sanitizers. But the problem is it leads to an enriched, organic, volatile environment. VOCs, um, uh, volatile organic compounds, are prevalent in this space. And it affects not just your own well-being, but also, for example, how plants grow in this environment that is so rich in alcohol, essentially. There is no real waste disposal. You have to be mindful and ideally recycle things. You cannot just throw it away. Urine, feces, clothing, packaging, all this has a very strong effect on what can be done in this confined space. The inability to dispose of waste is a tremendous challenge. The challenge is to use waste products and recycle things in an unknown, so far unknown way, to produce fresh compounds. And fresh compounds simply means growing plants. So the fact that I mentioned here fresh food is not available, this is about to change because the experiment that I just launched aims to grow as a first step radishes in a condition that is adaptable to the recycling condition for the future. So the other thing, very important for humans, we tend to have infections because of whatever or lacerations so medical assistance is required. When you have a small group of people, you may have a physician available, but that physician may not have all of the equipment available, readily available that you would have in a regular hospital on earth. So this is all a big challenge. And one of the thoughts that comes from this is, should all astronauts be of the same blood type? This is a kind of selection that one doesn't think of, but it does make sense in this context. There is no definitive word as to whether this is going to be the case, but this is one of the options 
we can consider. So I will give you an example of uh, weightlessness, and I sure hope you can listen to the sound. I'm not quite sure if Zoom is going to um, um, allow me to show this video with the um, corresponding sound. I would appreciate a feedback from someone in the audience to tell me whether um, uh, the sound is actually making the way. The question is, if you get a cloth dripping wet without gravity and you measure sure it, what, what will happen to the cloth? Yes. So, and then use equipment that was here on board the space station. We might have the coolest washcloths ever here on the space station. I'm going to show you. Here's one of our washcloths. And it's packed it. It's put down into this little tiny hockey puck so that uh, it saves space. But when you open up a hockey puck and you pull out your washcloth, this is the one I'm going to use for the experiment today. And so when you open up your hockey puck and turn it into a washcloth, it was compressed in a great big vice somewhere. Okay, so here's my washcloth, like a magic trick. And now I'm going to get this soaking wet, and then we're going to see what will happen when we wring it out. Merritt and Kendra suggested that I dip this in a bag, but bags don't hold water in space. So instead, I fill a water bag. This has drinking water in it. And I'm going to uh, squirt a bunch of water into this washcloth. Okay, so here's a soaking wet washcloth. Get the microphone so you can hear me while I'm talking. And now let's, let's start wringing it out. It's really wet. The water. the water is all over my hands, in fact, it rings out of the cloth into my hands. And if I let go of the cloth carefully, the water sort of has it stick to my hand. Okay, so the experiment worked beautifully. And the answer to the question is, the water squeezes out of the cloth, and then because of the surface tension of the water, it, um, it actually runs along the surface of the cloth and then up into my hand, almost like you had jello on your hands or gel on your hand, and it'll just stay there. Wonderful moisturizer on my hands. And the cloth doesn't really unravel itself. It just stays there floating like a, uh, like a dog's chew toy, soaking wet. Great experiment, worked perfectly. So, I hope you appreciate that the behavior of fluids, not just water, in space is completely different from anything that we are familiar with on Earth. The second short video is another um, example of how phases, gas and liquid phases, interact. And this is also done on the ISS simply by inserting a, um, an Alka-Seltzer into a drop of water. I hope you folks are trying to guess what's going to happen. What, what's going to happen to the role of all of these bubbles that, be, that are going to be released? So the chemistry proceeds normally. But the question is, what happens with the excess of gas that builds up in this sphere of water? And I believe you can see that the volume of air... The first time I did this, I had no idea what was going to happen. 
I had a couple of preconceived ideas that both of those were wrong. And water so expands. It. It's going to show that sometimes you just have to do an experiment in order to figure out what's going to happen. So the surface tension of the water remains very strong until sort of an explosion happens. And of course, and then well, the water here is so salvation to uh, zero gravity heartburn. Okay, the same is true when it comes to fire. You can see an example. In an ordinary candle flame, thousands of chemical reactions take place. Hydrocarbon molecules from the wick are vaporized and cracked apart by heat. They combine with oxygen to produce light, heat, carbon dioxide, and water. Some of the hydrocarbon fragments form ring-shaped molecules called polysilic aromatic hydrocarbons, and eventually, Soot. Soot particles can themselves burn or simply drift away as smoke. The familiar teardrop shape of the flame is an effect caused by gravity. Hot air rises and draws fresh, cool air behind it. This is called buoyancy and is what makes the flame shoot up and flicker. But what happens when you light a candle, say, on the International Space Station? In microgravity, flames burn differently. They form little spheres, says Williams. Space station play balls turn out to be wonderful mini labs for combustion research. Unlike flames on Earth, which expand greedily when they need more fuel, flame balls let the oxygen come to them. Oxygen and fuel combine in a narrow zone at the surface of the sphere, not hindering yawn throughout the flame. It's a much simpler system. Recently, Williams and colleagues were doing a space station experiment called FLEX to learn how to put out fires in microgravity when they came across something odd. Small droplets of heptane were burning inside the flux combustion chamber. As planned, the flames went out, but unexpectedly the droplets of fuel continued burning. That's right, burning without flames, says Williams. At first we didn't believe it ourselves. In fact, Williams believes the flames are there, just too faint to see. These are cool flames, he explains. Ordinary visible fire burns at a high temperature between 2200 and 3100 degrees Fahrenheit. Heptane flame balls on the space station started out in this hot fire regime. But as the flame balls cooled and began to go out, a different kind of burning took over. Cool flames burn at the relatively low temperature of 400 to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, says Williams, and their chemistry is completely different. Normal flames produce soot, carbon dioxide, and water. Cool flames produce carbon monoxide and formaldehyde. Similar cool flames have been produced on Earth, but they flicker out almost immediately. On the space station, however, cool flames can burn for nearly a minute. So, I think these examples illustrate different conditions and results that are only explainable if buoyancy is no longer active. Buoyancy is very critical for all kinds of gas exchanges or fluid behavior. If you think of the flame that we just saw and you recall that diffusion is limiting the amount of oxygen available for combustion, the same step becomes limiting for plant growth. If you have only CO2 reaching leaves, where CO2 is fixed into carbohydrates, um, arriving by diffusion. So this is a major impediment for successful cultivation of plants in space. The only way to overcome it, luckily is relatively simple, is to mix things by virtue of a fan. And then we can establish a greater exchange rate that then leads to um, better combustion or CO2 uptake in plants. This picture here shows what gravity or the lack of gravity does to people. When astronauts or cosmonauts land after an extended period in space where the muscles were not 
needed, they are weakened and muscle atrophy takes place. So they have to rest on these chairs while everyone around them cheers. And this person right here is actually the one who showed us how water behaves in space. So this was his um, landing after he returned um, from an extended period um, of time in space. So, the result or the reminder of this picture is that if you are medically inclined, space medicine is what has the biggest future. It may seem exotic because it's not accessible, but I will give you examples of space medicine being tested right now in many different places. So, what do we have to consider? Gravity on Earth is exemplified by this cartoon here. A person stands upright as we normally do, and the force of gravity compresses or moves fluid down towards the feet. If gravity is not active, you have this condition, and you see the puffiness of astronauts and what is described here as bird legs, thin legs, because the same mechanism is effective inside the body that under normal condition leads to a physiologically normal distribution of the fluid in the body. In the absence of gravity, these effects remain, but it means that a shift of fluid towards the head occurs. And that imbalance causes a lot of issues, some of which I will explain in a minute. To test this, we have different ways. One is the so-called bed rest study. So in this drawing here, you see two examples. One is a mimicking weightlessness, and that is done by a negative six-degree head tilt bed rest. So a person, a volunteer, lays at negative six degrees and that causes the same fluid shift as you would experience in space. Since this is accessible for everyone to perform, you can be your own volunteer and see what difference it makes when you do not sleep on the horizontal but a head tilted bed. What it does to your uh, restfulness and physiological responses. But you can change this also to mimic, for example, 0.38 G. That is the um, gravity level that we have on Mars. And so we can manipulate gravitational effects by putting um, the position in place that corresponds to either negating gravitational effect or weakening them so that we can uh, mimic uh, gravity conditions of the Moon or Mars, as in this example. In animal studies, it's quite common to use so-called hind limb suspension. You may have heard of this. And what happens is that, in this case, a rat is um, put into a contraption that prevents it from using its hind legs. These animals uh, run around and they're not restricted in their movement, but their hind legs will not ex be exposed to a surface interaction. Therefore, muscle atrophy begins to develop just like um, we see in space in astronauts. So this condition can be studied more, more carefully in centrifugation experiments. And you see, I, I took some information from a paper that was recently, uh, meaning less than two months ago, published in the Journal of Physiology 2020, and it uses a so-called short-arm centrifuge to position um, volunteers at, at discrete points. So in this case of this diagram, sorry, you will see... Nah, why do I do this? A um, line in the middle, this is the rotational axis where 
um, the radius of the centrifuge is zero and therefore no rotational force is exerted. When you position the heart level or the, the aortic barrel pressure receptor or the cortoid pressure receptor or the eyes in this particular position and then started rotating the centrifuge, you can combine effects on fluid shifts towards the head and towards the feet at different G levels based on the rotational speed of the centrifuge. And you can study if the heart rate changes, if pressure perception and um, responses change. So those are very modern types of uh, physiological studies that are available to mimic and therefore understand the effect of gravity on different bodily configurations. Another thing that is very important as a result of this head shift of fluids is the consequence on um, the eyes. And what you see very often in astronauts is what is shown right here. This eye is noticeably flattened. And so that means that um, astronauts typically suffer from visual impairment, short-sightedness, because of the compression uh, of the eyeball um, on the retinal side of the eye. Unfortunately, some of this um, impairment is permanent. It does It does not go away. Gosh. I apologize for this. The computer is misbehaving. Uh, maybe it's me. So it's partially permanent. In addition to changes of the eyeball, you see changes in um, the optic nerve where edema is, meaning uh, accumulation of fluids, uh, develops and that can lead to a punching uh, uh, constriction of the optical nerve and that is very um, uh, gender specific because it uh, occurs mostly in males and the last line that I put down here is this simply an effect of only one condition that is the fluid shift towards the head or are other factors also important? There is reason that indicates that CO2 may be involved. Um, I will talk about CO2 a little later, but uh, you know that on the ISS, the typical CO2 level is about 3,500 um, parts per million. On Earth, it keeps going up, but it's only around 400. So there is a huge involvement of CO2, and CO2 is a physiologically active gas. Among other things, it determines when we have to breathe. So it is possible that CO2 also has effects on um, the eye. But the effect on the eye is not just limited to an observation in um, uh, or a change in the uh, focus of the eyeball, it also um, is something that is sensitive to radiation events. And so this example here shows that as the satellite is moving in this typically sinusoidal uh, shape around actually a sphere, when you flatten it, that uh, turns into the sinusoidal curve, there is a higher propensity to experience so-called shooting stars. Shooting stars are the result of um, radiation events, as you see right here. These individual dots are ions that are available at higher concentration in space than they are on the ground. And in particular, at the Southern Atlantic anomaly, where the shielding by the Van Allen belts is weakened, astronauts experience a high incident of shooting stars 
which is a visual perception that is not related to light, but radiation events. This happens even when they go into a sleep position, as you see here. And I remind you the lack of privacy and the very odd way of going to sleep is illustrated here. It's important. So when we look at radiation, it's important to realize what types we have, alpha particles of no concern, gamma rays and x-rays helpful for um, um, medical investigations, neutrons highly damaging for living things and um, um, non-living things because they tend to make things radioactive. But the most important thing is um, ionizing radiation such as high energy protons and iron and uh, carbon atoms that originate from the sun or even other stars. These effects become critical for travel to Mars. And this slide here shows that on uh, the ground, any campus um, has about 0.1 microsievers per hour. When you go and fly, this is 40 times larger in an airplane. It's 300 times larger at the ISS and more almost a thousand times larger when you transition to Mars. And on Mars itself, it's about the same level as you have on the ISS. So the radiation load is much higher when you go to Mars, especially during transit. And so we need to study this. My pitch of considering space medicine can focus on radiation research. So when you look, I don't expect you to, uh, to, to read this table, but when you look at the most important things shown here in red that are relevant for um, space research, you have things that are focusing on vision impairment and intracranial pressure that has to do with mental acuity. Another thing is kidney stone formation because the atrophy of the muscle results in a weakening of the bones, the reason that the astronauts have to sit down. Adequate food and nutrition, radiation, and this gas carbon dioxide that exists at high concentration. These are the topics that anyone who is medically interested should uh, attempt to study, and you will automatically become a member of the crew that studies space conditions. So, the last point is to give you some um, examples of my own research. I did do some radiation biology. We have the Louisiana Accelerator Center, LAC, which uh, I have used to do experiments. I was also lucky to have some access to the Brookhaven National Laboratory and exposed radish seeds to 40 and 200 centigrade. That is about the level of radiation that we experience on the ISS. I point you to the previous chart. I also studied previously gravity sensing mechanisms in plants in two um, space experiments, and I use lots of clinostats or gravity compens sorry, gravity compensators. I don't know if this is always advancing instead of allowing me to use the pointer. 